Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Pam Waters. I am the Business Development Director for the Gardens at St. Elizabeth, located right in your community at 32nd and Federal. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of our first responders. We so appreciate everything that you do. At the Gardens of St. Elizabeth, we provide affordable luxury living for those in need of independent and or assisted living services. In addition, we're very excited. We are currently building a new memory care so we can serve all the needs of our residents. With memory care, we will be providing specialized training and ongoing education for our staff and therefore, we would like to share some of this education with you. So I would like to introduce Meredith Brunk with Legacy Healthcare Services, one of our trusted partners as our presenter. Meredith is an occupational therapist and regional director of clinical services. Her passion lies in providing quality care to older adults, and she has spent the majority of her career specializing in providing treatment to those with dementia and their caregivers. Meredith is a certified dementia practitioner through the NCCDP and a dementia care specialist through CPI. Please welcome Meredith Brunk. Thank you, Pam. And thank you, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here today. And thank you for joining us today. Yes, my name is Meredith. I am an occupational therapist. I've been working for um, uh, working in occupational therapy for over 10 years and with Legacy for over five years. Legacy provides physical, occupational, and speech therapy to um, independent assisted living and memory care and some SNF communities. So we partner with many communities to really enhance the quality of care um, that they're able to provide to their residents and keep their residents aging in place um, with dignity, safety, and a high level of independence. So thank you for joining. Um, and thank you again for everything you do in our community to keep our community safe and well. That is very much appreciated. I don't think we could thank you enough. And I hope that you find this information today helpful for you. I am going to present for about 30 minutes and then we'll have time at the end to answer questions. So I encourage you to pop some questions in the chat box if you have those along the way and we'll, um, we'll discuss them at the end. And my colleague, Jessie Pipel, she might be joining as well. And she's a physical therapist in many, many of our me memory care communities and she'll be able to help field some questions with me as well. So you'll have a small panel as you ask questions. So today we're going to discuss some of the basics of dementia and cognition, and then how cognition then impacts communication. And after that, we're going to talk through several strategies to allow you to tailor your interactions with individuals who have dementia or other cognitive um, impairments to best support them to make your encounters run more smoothly and to keep them as safe as possible um, and for their interaction with you to be as beneficial uh, for them as possible. So first we'll discuss a bit about terminology. So dementia is not necessarily a specific disease, but it's an overarching term that we use for a group of symptoms that impact memory, thinking, social abilities severely enough to then impact an individual's daily functioning. Some of the conditions that cause dementia are listed here. So I know a lot of us are familiar with Alzheimer's disease. That's um, at usually an insidious onset and slowly progressive decline. These individuals have a lot of short-term memory impairments in the early stage, and then deficits with word recall and executive functions later on. Frontotemporal dementia is another type of common dementia for these folks. This is where you see those personality changes. So a lot of behavioral disturbances because their, um, their in inhibition mechanism is impaired. So you might see a lot of aggression, 
agitation, or maybe someone who used to be very motivated now shows a lot of apathy in their new um, changed personality. Lewy body dementia is also another common type. And in these folks, you see fluctuating levels of cognition. You might also see some Parkinsonianism where they have um, that difficulty with movement, rigidity, some of those tremors. And then they also can have some pretty significant visual hallucinations. And then we also see vascular dementia. That's usually, that can be sudden or gradual, and it's usually correlated with a cerebrovascular disease or incident such as a stroke or then worsening hypertension or coronary heart disease, et cetera. So for these folks, you're seeing um, mild to more severe cognitive impairments, and then they have additional other difficulties. So that's a bit about terminology, but we do know that for all of our folks who fall under the category of dementia, we understand this to be a progressive disease process, that there is no cure for at this time. And so we can expect to see worsening memory, attention, um, worsening ability to speak coherently, worsening movement patterns. So it really impacts their, their full daily functioning. Another thing to note is prevalence. Some more recent studies that we're looking at are finding that approximately seven out of 10 residents in assisted living communities, so that would be assisted or memory care, um, have moderate cognitive impairments in line with early to middle stage dementia. So many of the folks that you would encounter in residential care communities are going to, to have cognitive impairments. And so I hope you find a lot of this information helpful as it applies to a lot of residents in our residential care communities. So then what is the framework that we can use for understanding someone's cognition? The approach we use um, to understand cognitive function is based on two theories. Claudia Allen, she the first theory um, created by Claudia Allen, she was an occupational therapist and she created a system for describing the functional abilities of people with cognitive deficits. So in her theory, people are assigned um, an Allen level and that tells us what their cognitive ability is. There are six different Allen levels from one being the lowest level and six being normal cognition for someone. Each level describes how a person functions and what abilities they have. So one of the reasons we use the Allen levels in assessing um, people's cognitive abilities is that knowing a person's Allen level helps us really understand the amount of cognitive support that someone requires. And so it's a good framework for us all to understand and highlight a person's abilities rather than thinking and spending time talking about what they can't do. It's important for us to highlight and honor what they can do and try to maximize that. And then we see our responsibility as therapists, as caregivers, to really tailor our approach and modify the environment they are in to best support their functioning and promote their ability to be safe and independent. The second element of our approach to interacting with residents who have dementia is the theory of retrogenesis. So retrogenesis means back, back to birth, and it applies to people with cognitive function in this way that those skills and abilities that were acquired last in an individual's cognitive development are the first ones to actually be lost as they have cognitive decline. So that would mean things like managing um, finances, managing medications. Those were learned a little bit later in life, middle school, high school, right? And so those are some of the skills that we see people with cognitive deficits start losing um, early on. So in our independent living communities, for instance, 
managing meals, managing their finances. This, these might be the reasons that they have moved into some of these residential care communities because with a little bit of cognitive loss, they're experiencing loss in some of those skills. So let's look a little briefly at how these two theories work together. So this slide shows us how the Allen cognitive levels and theory of retrogenesis work together. We could spend a lot of time talking about it, but the most important information I think to highlight today for you all is the connection between the stage of dementia and the developmental age. For me, this has really given me perspective into what a person is understanding and how, like we've talked about, how I need to modify or how as caregivers, as first responders, it's appropriate to modify what we're saying and what we're doing to best support um, that individual. For example, someone at an early stage of dementia correlates to an Allen level four. And at this stage, an individual's cognitive abilities range from someone from the abilities we'd see in a four to 10 year old. So that doesn't mean that we necessarily treat the person as if they're a child, but it gives us a perspective and framework to understand what cognitive abilities they do have. And like I said, how we modify based on that. So then for our folks living in a memory care type community and some in assisted living, they would be functioning at the Allen level three, which means they're functioning similar to an 18 month to three year old. So for the toddlers in your life, think about the amount of supervision and constant cueing you are providing to them um, to help them through their day to day, right? You wouldn't expect them to be able to get up, get dressed, get their breakfast, and head out to school on their own. You provide step-by-step -step cueing, put your shoes on, now where's your coat? And then for breakfast, they might help you, but you are the one overseeing that whole process because you know that they don't have the safety awareness, that um, their attention to sequence through all the different steps of making the breakfast isn't um, there yet, that they don't have the problem solving skills. Um, and so you're, you're really doing most of that task for them. So that's how I, I think about um, our individuals who have cognitive deficits. It is helpful to refer back to maybe what developmental age they're functioning at. And those in the threes, um, think about their communication and emotional regulation for your, the toddlers you interact with, they can speak in, in phrases and, and simple sentences perhaps, but they're not understanding everything in context and they have difficulty regulating their emotions. So they might still have tantrums at times because they're really tired and they don't know how to communicate how they're feeling at this moment in time. Similarly to our folks with dementia, um, they have lost some of the abilities to communicate how they're feeling at that moment in time, and they don't have the um, emotional regulation skills that they once could employ. So this is a list of the cognitive processes that are impacted by dementia. Um, and it's probably not exhaustive either, but memory, so many of our folks don't have short-term memory. So asking them things like why they fell a few minutes ago, they probably don't remember that and that's going to be difficult. So it's important for us to maybe gather that information from someone else. Attention, many of fo the folks who have cognitive deficits or dementia don't have the skilled attention skills that we have. So they can't focus in on one thing. We can be in a crowded restaurant and tune out all of that noise and people walking by us. That's not, um, someone with dementia is going to have a lot of difficulty attending to the meal in front of them when there's all of that stimulation around them. 
orientation wise, so they might not know what day it is or what year it is. Learning is going to be severely impaired thinking and reasoning, so they're going to have difficulty making appropriate and safe decisions. Problem solving is significantly impaired. Language, we mentioned this a bit already, but as someone progresses to lower levels of cognition and later stages of dementia, that's when you might start to see that word salad uh, where you hear them say, she was over there and, and black on black, hit it, hit it. And it's not making sense to us, but, but that individual is trying to communicate something. And so we need to be in tune with how they're feeling and what the environment is to try to deduce what they're telling us. Or maybe they're only saying one or two words at a time. And so it requires us to think about, think through what they might be trying to communicate. Vision and perception is impaired. So as people progress through dementia stages, their visual field shrinks. This is really important to understand too, so that our folks in assisted living or memory care, if they're at a moderate stage of dementia, their visual field is now only two to three feet in front of them. So think about um, how confusing the world would be if all you're seeing is the two to three front feet in front of you um, and, and they're not able to scan as well and so you and I we look around we see many many feet in front of us we're taking in all of that visual information whereas someone with dementia isn't able to anymore and so that's part of the reason that the world is confusing to them and then um, social socially and emotional skills we've talked about um, are impaired quite a bit as well so then we think about how these processes, how these limitations impact their ability to communicate with us. Communication, as we know, is our connection between people. It comes in many forms, um, but it's definitely the building block of relationships and um, important, very important in us understanding the world around us and interacting with the world around us. And to create positive, a positive connection requires effective communication. And communication, we know, involves a sender and then a message and then a receiver and um, usually feedback. And that's the process of communication. So the message is really what needs to be understood in the same way it needs to be understood by the receiver in the same way that the sender meant it right, the same way the sender intended for it to be understood. And this is the step that we run into difficulties, sometimes in regular communication among our peers, but especially with our individuals who have dementia, that's that message and what's being perceived by them um, and what we perceive from them, that's the area that really gets tripped up. It can be a real challenge to verify that we're getting the correct message from them. And similarly, it can be equally challenging to know that they are receiving the message that we mean to send as well. So when a resident demonstrates negative behaviors, it's important for us to understand that that is their way of communicating with us. Every behavior is their message. It's an attempt to convey what they can't convey in a normal way, what they don't have the words to necessarily say. Um, and, and so this is really the key and the crux of, of how we interact with our individuals who have dementia, is understanding that their behaviors are their way of communicating something with us. Their goal might be to be more comfortable or to get something to eat or drink, or to get away from an unfamiliar situation or person. So then as therapists and hopefully as, as first responders, you see that as part of your responsibility to assess what might be causing the resident to be behaving in this way. And how can we modify our approach or what we're saying or what environment we're putting them in to support them, make them feel at ease, and make them um, 
be able to, to better participate and communicate with us to keep them ultimately safer. So they might be hitting because they're in pain or they might be yelling because they're hungry or maybe they're grabbing at us because they need to use the bathroom. That's the message that they're trying to send. And so it's really up to us to figure out what that message is and to respond in a way that they understand our message as well. So we're going to talk about a few ways to engage and communicate as effectively as possible with our individuals who have dementia. And we talked about earlier, um, understanding those Allen levels in our, in our communication. It's also important to remember that we want to highlight what they can do and really maximize their participation and engagement in, in our interactions with them. So here are some strategies that help alleviate or mitigate behaviors when we are responding to someone um, who has dementia. So one, one thing is to place ourselves within their world and try to understand what they're attempting to communicate to us. We want to remember, again, their behavior is their way of communicating something. Maybe they just need you to hold their hand for a minute so that they can calm down. Um, maybe for them, right now their world is 1950 and their parents are coming over for dinner tonight. So they don't have time to talk to you or answer your questions. We don't necessarily need to correct them about that as long as it's safe for them to continue um, being in that world of 1950 and their parents are coming over. So we can validate how they feel and then redirect them. So validate them by saying, that's great. Your parents are good people. And then moving on. Can you lift your arm for me? or other types of validation saying, I know this hurts, or I'm sorry you're upset, or I know this is confusing. Think about what they might be experiencing because they can't necessarily name that, and maybe we can name it for them and validate. And then the redirection of if they're perseverating on something, it might, be, it might work best to validate and redirect. So if they're saying, oh, I need to call my mom, I need to call my mom, we might say, you're right, we're calling your mom right now. Now, can you stand up with me? Something like that. Because not, not validating them is going to usually um, heighten the anxiety that they're experiencing or um, kind of escalate some of their behaviors because now we're not attending to what they're communicating to us. Speaking in a pleasant and calm tone is always going to be helpful, reassuring them that you're there to help, smiling, being calm and pleasant as long as we can. Um, the resident will be able to feel if we are hurried or aggressive with them, and they might not be able to, they don't have the ability to understand why that is, that this is an urgent situation and that's why we're here to help them. And so as calm and pleasant as we can be to de-escalate their behaviors, that's going to be most beneficial for them and um, save time for us and, and get us to the point where we can help them in the way that's best. Always gaining their attention. So using, um, being in front of them, using their first name, making eye contact with them. So if they're someone who's sitting in a wheelchair, that means kneeling down to their level and being right in front of them. Remember their visual field is, might be very reduced. And so if we're standing five feet away to the side and trying to ask um, Mr. Smith a bunch of questions, now we're not even within his visual world. Uh, and so that's confusing and just ad additional stimulation that he doesn't know how to process. Responding to, to their body language and behaviors and don't rely on words alone. Remember, they're trying to, they're attempting to communicate something to us in the way that, um, in the way that they're emoting or in the um, behaviors that they're using. For us, we want to use simple sentences and one step directions as much as we can. So instead of saying something like, 
hey, I'm, I'm Bill, I'm a paramedic, I'm here to help you and check on you and make sure you're okay, but I need you to stand up and come over here with me and, oh, and what's your date of birth? That's like seven things we just said to that individual. They're not going to be able to process all of that information. So we need to break it down to, hi, I'm Bill. I'm a paramedic. I'm here to check on you. Introducing one thing at a time, or even if um, paramedic isn't simple enough for them, I work with the doctor or something like that. And then waiting for them to process that. And then can you stand up for me? I'll help you. So making things as simple um, and, and paring them down to one step at a time. And then being patient. I know that um, cases, the cases in which you're responding uh, are usually urgent. If the, if the resident is safe, though, being as patient as possible and allowing them as much time as they need to process the information, the better, because we know that our individuals who have dementia may need 15 seconds or so to process what we're saying. They can't, they don't have the cognitive ability to process as quickly as you and I. And so they're pro as their processing mechanisms are impaired, they're going to need a lot more time to process what we're saying. And we need to allow that to them if it's safe to do so. So if we try to repeat the same thing over and over again, like Jane, get up. Come on, Jane, get up. Jane, why aren't you getting up? Each time we say that, we're resetting Jane's processing clock. So she's just back at what we said the first time. And now we're repeating over and over and she needs to, to try to process again and again. That would, that would be agitating and confusing. So no wonder our residents get agitated with us if that's how, um, how we're interacting with them. So really allowing their, them enough time to process and hopefully our tone and volume is also calm and patient with them as well in our body language too. Using nouns instead of pronouns. So instead of saying it's down there, we might say your shoe is on the floor. Instead of saying, I'm going to help you over here, we might say, I'm going to help you onto the bed because they don't have the language ability to infer what we mean by those pronouns. So that's why it's important to use the actual noun. Anticipating their needs, so remember that they aren't able to effectively communicate that. So offering food or drink or attending to if they're soiled or wet or, or might be in pain. Maybe they're pulling away or grimacing or groaning or grabbing at their wrist. And that's their way of telling you, my wrist really hurts because they're not able to actually say that to you. Using different types of cues to send a message. So showing them visually, um, for example, the blood pressure cuff, as you say, I'm going to check your blood pressure or I'm going to place this on your arm. So visually showing them in addition to verbalizing what you're going to do for them and with them. Reducing triggers. So if it's, if it's a space where there are a lot of people coming and going and um, there's, there are loud noises, maybe fire alarms going off, as much as possible, if it's safe to move them into a quieter environment to continue assessing them, that's going to um, elicit a more beneficial engagement with them. Think about the lighting, the sounds, the smells. Remember that we can tune out all of those sensations, but they are having difficulty processing all of that. And that might be really overstimulating to them and contributing to why they are feeling very anxious and are maybe acting out in different ways of swatting or, or um, yelling at you. So thinking about how the environment might be um, contributing to the way that they're communicating, they are very uncomfortable. And lastly, I just wanted to talk through a few different situations that you might be responding to and use those strategies, talk through those strategies 
as they relate to these situations. So a specific situation I know of recently that happened is that the fire department was called to an independent living apartment where there was a possible fire. The resident had actually bumped into his oven dials and they turned on and he had a styrofoam container sitting on top of his um, oven and that ended up melting. So in this case, the resident did not have the safety awareness capabilities to realize that leaving a styrofoam container um, sitting on top on his stove top was a poor plan. And then he didn't have the problem solving abilities to know that um, what to do to call 911 right away. And also individuals with dementia, their senses might be diminished a bit. So maybe he wasn't even smelling that the container was melting and he may have been in a different room and not smelling that. So you all are experts in responding to emergent situations and maintaining the safety of everyone involved. But in terms of how to engage as um, well as possible for these individuals who have dementia or significant cognitive impairments, these are a few items that might be beneficial in this type of situation after you've made sure everyone is safe. Um, making him, this resident, feel as calm as possible. Talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. I think a lot of times we, um, we approach a resident in a, as a group, and so there are three different people asking him questions and talking to him. That's very overwhelming. So trying to have one point person who talks to him and asks him some questions and makes him feel at ease and reassures him, that's usually going to be a better situation for him. Ensuring that he can hear and see us, so kneeling at his level if he's sitting down. Trying to read his nonverbal communication about how he's feeling and validate that. Asking one question at a time and allowing him time to process that. Then asking other people if there are other caregivers that we can gather information from, that's ideal because he may not remember um, what happens or why and trying to remember might um, make him upset. So if we can gather information from others, that's ideal as well. And then it, after, um, after resolving the situation, I think referring out to additional social services, because you all are responding to some situations um, for the first time that someone's aware that this in, individual might be in, in an unsafe environment, even if it's not in an independent living community, but they're living at their home. And so referring then to additional so, social service supports is going to be really helpful to prevent this in the future, because based on what we've seen that he has poor safety awareness and problem solving skills that tells us that his cognition might be at the level that it's not as safe for him to continue living his, in his current environment or that he just needs some additional supports to be safe in his current environment to prevent this in the future. Because we do want to promote um, a person aging in their current environment as much as possible um, and just providing supports to, to get them to the level that they are safe and um, as independent as possible in that environment. Another situation might be responding to a call from um, from an assisted living community, maybe one of their residents fell and hit their head. And upon arriving, that resident is saying lots of gibberish and maybe swatting at the caregivers. So what, how do we de-escalate that situation? How is it best to approach that resident? So obviously you're ensuring the resident and those around them are safe. But we know in that situation, that person with dementia is likely already fearful and stressed out. Their flight or fight response is engaged at this point in time. And we can see that in the ways that they are uh, maybe uh, talking gibberish, swatting. And so we need to provide reassurance. We need to be calm. Um, reassuring touch, so holding their hand as that might be appropriate, reassuring them that they are safe. Again, thinking through why are they swatting at us? Is it because they're overwhelmed? They're having difficulty processing everything? 
or is it because they're in pain, they're uncomfortable? So trying to assess what might be, what they might be communicating in that swatting. Maybe, so then maybe that looks like asking to clear the room a bit to make it quieter. So it's just you and them. Um, maybe they were told before you got there, no, Mrs. Jones, stay there, don't move, don't move. And so once we come, we can be a lot more calm and reassuring and say, we're here to help. We want to keep you safe, Mrs. Jones. Try not to overwhelm them again with too many people asking them too many questions because they're already stressed and anxious. Ensuring that they can hear us and see us by communicating, being in front of them at their eye level, um, using their name, and then allowing them enough time to process what we say, asking them or saying one thing at a time, asking the caregivers and others questions about what happened again, similar to that first situation, because this individual likely can't um, report to you what exactly happened. Be, just be calm and, and um, calm and patient in the way that we engage with them saying something like, I'm going to put this cuff around your arm. It's not going to hurt. Making sure that we're talking through the ways in which we're helping them rather than just doing it to them. I think often we get into a place where we're just doing what we have to do uh, ultimately to keep them safe. So we have the best intentions, but making sure that we are explaining to them what's happening is going to um, make our jobs easier and, and um, really benefit them, that resident. And then another case might be responding to a call in a memory care facility where a resident is being combative and maybe seems to be unsafe um, to, toward other residents. So in that case, it's important, obviously, to ensure everyone's safe again. But Again, the more calmly we can approach the situation, the more likely the resident will respond positively. So likely by the time we've come, the situation has escalated a little bit. So remember, think about what they might be experiencing, that they're likely now very confused, very frightened, their fight or flight response is activated, and this is why we're seeing these aggressive and combative behaviors. So us being really aggressive back or really assertive back to them will likely contribute even more to their confusion and their frightenedness. So instead we might approach them just one person, one-on-one, -on -one, reassuring them, giving them one-step commands, giving them enough time to process what we say, so something like, hi, Mrs. Smith, I'm Kate. I'm here to help you. I'm sorry you're upset. Come sit with me. And then the last situation, if a resident does need transported to the hospital and they are a resident in one of, um, in an assisted living or memory care type community where we know they're, um, they have a moderate level of dementia. So even if they, can't verbally communicate to us, it's still important to be communicating to them what is happening, what we are doing, rather than just doing it to them. So saying, we're going to help move you onto this bed. We're going to lift you up on the count of three. One, two, three. And speaking directly to them instead of talking to our colleagues. So instead of saying, let's put this belt around her, we would say, to Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, I need to put this belt around you. It should not hurt. It will keep you safe. And then trying to keep all interactions um, as calm as possible and with minimal changes to the environment and personnel. So every additional environment change or new person we introduce to them, that is additionally confusing uh, to them. So if we can keep them in one spot with the same few people until they uh, are ready to be assessed even better. Um, just minimizing the, the amount of environments and different people that we're engaging them with is going to ultimately um, be better for them and keep them more calm 
and able to participate with us as well. One person communicating to them at a time, reassuring them, um, all of those, all of those strategies that we've been talking through. So that's the end of um, what I had to present. Do we have some questions to talk through today, Pam? I don't see anything in the chat, but I would welcome anyone to put something in the chat and let us know if you have a question for Meredith. I was just gonna add, thanks Meredith. I thought that was a really, really wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Jesse, I'm a manager with Legacy Healthcare and I'm a physical therapist myself. And I've been working in the memory care um, environment for a decade now. And we have seen first responders come to some incidents um, in our communities. And one thing I noticed is that some residents respond very well to uniform or very well to like the authoritative figures. And then some that can be very frightening. So I think um, just kind of recognizing that piece as you come in, um, it can be overwhelming as Meredith has mentioned, the more people, the more confusing or the more scary it can be, no matter of uniform or not. When we have multiple people coming to try to well, they, they're helping us, we think they're coming to attack us. And so kind of keeping it very simple and having one person be the leader and having that calm um, approach is gonna be very, very effective. So I just wanted to highlight that and, and thank you all for everything you're doing. And thanks, Meredith. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining today and to our presenters, we so appreciate it. Um, thank you for everything that you do in the community and the information was fabulous. We will be using this as we move forward. So thank you so much. And thank you to the Gardens of St. Elizabeth for hosting. And yes, thank you to everyone for all that you're doing. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, great information, appreciate it. Thanks.